to Mind Escape. Are you ready? Are you ready to escape your mind? All right, folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number, what is this, 309 tonight. Wow. Special episode. Um, You know, I was talking with Dr. Greg Little, and he was doing the survey thing, and we decided to link up and do this episode on the uh, solar eclipse that happened last week um, and just talk about any sort of anomalies that happened. He, He... well, he'll go into it more. I'll let him describe it. But um, if you want to support Dr. Greg, go down to the bottom. I've got a link to all of his books and his X profile. If you're on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, uh, go check him out on there. He's constantly posting um, stuff about mounds and Native American culture and all that kind of wonderful stuff. So go check that out. If you want to support Mind Escape, the best way to do it is click the link tree link down below. Um, there's tons of stuff on there. Leave us a nice review check out all of our other stuff. Uh, also, Dr. Greg is in our documentary, As Within, So Without, from UFOs to DMT. Go check out that documentary. The link is also down below. But uh, without further ado, welcome back on. How are you? I'm good. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm um, in the process of getting ready to uh, post this, so I will do that now. Uh, to I know there are people waiting on... Um, Facebook and Twitter. I do not know how many there will be, but we'll see in a moment. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to thank you. I want to start by thanking you uh, for doing this. I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, it's uh, you're a really good outlet for this. Uh, and, you know, I know you have quite a few people and so on that, uh, that watch your podcast and I've enjoyed being on. How many times have I been on your podcast? I mean, you might be on the most out of anybody. I'm trying to think, maybe like nine, ten wow. times, maybe. Really? <laughs> been a, yeah. I mean, it's been. I mean, and then I mean, you did. You came on with P.D. Newman recently, and we did the whole oh, yeah. Native American entheogen episode. So yeah, I yeah. mean, we've we've done a lot of episodes. That's for sure. Uh, I may actually um, talk a bit about P.D. Uh, in this, be in some of his theories, but. Anyway, um, so thanks a lot, and we are going to talk about the the magnetic survey we did. Uh, but I guess what I'd like to do is start with the background of this thing, where it came from and why. So it took me a while to find where I wrote all this, but back in 1994, and this is a reissued copy of the book Grand Illusions, which came out in 1994, the original cover I want to show, this was the original cover. Uh, and my wife and others said, it's got a black cover on it. Don't do that. And But anyway, uh, we reissued it. And on pages 112 and 113, there's a section. I know people can't see this, but it's called the night effect. And over here, uh, it's called the eclipse effect. Is that it? Yeah, the eclipse window. So what I speculated back then, and this was after uh, spending some time with at least one true Native American shaman, um, what I, whoa, I think I, I think I posted the, uh, the wrong video to people. Um, so I probably need to go back uh, and, and try this again. Um, Okay. Have you have you posted on your uh, yeah. your Twitter account? No, this? not not since we've been live. Uh, okay. Over, over the last minute okay. or two. Okay. Uh, because I posted the wrong one. I posted an old one up there that was on your site. Uh, so yeah, let, let me, me pull it up. see. Yeah, I mean, it might have just been for the channel or yeah, something. Yeah, I did a I did the wrong one there. Here, I'll post um, something too. Um. There it no, is. Okay. But, but yeah, no, I appreciate your thank I got you it and now. you're welcome. 
obviously anytime and this like you said i thought this was a cool idea and yeah let's do it all right so i'm gonna take one second here and uh redo this um okay you're fine <laughs> Jeez. how um how but, strange go ahead but yeah no i mean anybody that's listening leave us a comment about your experience with the eclipse if you saw it if you um had some weird experience or anything like that um i saw it uh i was just talking with dr greg my wife came home early uh from work had some glasses we uh we watched it took turns we tried to get our little guy outside he's he's a little over two um he wasn't leaving the glasses on so we didn't want to take the chance um him looking up but um, but yeah, no, we're not in the direct path. We're slightly off of it here in the Detroit area, but I mean, definitely. Do you want to show that you took some pictures? Oh right? yeah, yeah. Here, I'll pull up some, I have some pictures. Yeah. Good idea. Here's uh oh, here, let me pull up, take our names off there. Here's uh let me see if I can find a better one. So it's weird. It kind of just does look like the sun there. You get a little bit of a cross effect through the middle. There you go. There's that one. That's kind of like a close up of it. Again, unless you have like a high resolution camera or really know what you're doing, it's really hard to take pictures, even not of the eclipse, right? So. Okay. That was a weird one. I saw there was like a little crescent, which is kind of what the if you see that little crescent in the little aura underneath that's kind of what the eclipse here looked like if it was turned slightly to the left a little bit that's kind of what the full eclipse looked like here all right so i know that people nobody heard the initial one although this will be recorded and, and posted but anyway back in 1994 i wrote about the eclipse window and the night effect the eclipse window uh, had to do with a set of rituals that I know that Native Americans did when they knew about eclipses. And of course, there are mound sites we've actually discussed on your podcast before that predicted eclipses because they charted the 18.61 uh, year lunar cycle. So we know there were sites that did that. I know too, I've talked to some that actually had, had been involved in some eclipse rituals. Uh, and then there's some things in the old literature. And it's more than just, you know, the chief coming out and saying, I'm going to blot the sun out today and then saying, now I'll show you my power and bring it back. It's more than that. So I have always been interested also in electromagnetic effects. And I've, I've looked at and speculated about mounds and earthworks and uh, why they were shaped the way they were, and what the effect would be with people moving through these various shapes, through openings, going into uh, earthwork circles, octagons, and so on. And it's it's been very interesting to me. So in 1992, a substance called, or a mineral called magnetite was discovered in the human brain. And it made it... Uh, uh, it made sense of a disorder that has been quite controversial in medicine for decades, and it's called electromagnetic sensitivity. There actually are people who can sense a magnet placed behind their head. There are people that are electromagnetically sensitive who get headaches. They have a lot of stress and anxiety in certain electromagnetic fields with uh, certain frequencies and strengths. Uh, and I have always believed that there's something to this that was um, with the magnetic effects and its effect on brain chemistry that related to the con conducting of rituals, not just the use of drugs in it, which we, we may or may not talk about here a bit later, but just the effects of moving through different electromagnetic fields. And I believe that during an eclipse, I, I thought that during an eclipse, there would be um, some sort of an electromagnetic blip that would occur because the solar winds are blocked by the moon in a full eclipse. The solar winds are blocked by the, the moon. 
there is research, scientific research, numerous studies that do say that the electromagnetic fields on Earth and the magnetic field do change a little bit during an eclipse. And as soon as the eclipse is over, they return to normal. So I wanted to see if the eclipse, if this effect was strong enough in an eclipse to actually move a needle on like this is a, a, it's not cheap, but this is a good hiking compass. Uh, it is an engineering compass. The army had these, a lot of people carried them. Uh, an archeologist commented to me that uh, he knew there were magnetic changes on the earth during an eclipse, but he doubted they would be strong enough to move a needle on a compass. And the idea that I had is that if it could move a needle on a compass, then it could move magnetite in the brain. We know now that magnetite that is in the brain, particularly in the hippocampus and limbic system, that it actually physically moves in the brain because of magnetic fields. As you go from different fields, the magnetite physically moves. And in the process, it should create some sort of biochemical changes in the brain. So it sounds like a far out theory, but that's, that's really what I wanted to test. There's one more piece to this. In the late 1980s, around 1988 and 89, and then in the 90s, there was a researcher by the name of Nicholas Reiter. His last name is spelled R-E-I-T-E-R. -E -E Not Reiter as in writing, but uh, R-E-I-T-E-R. Reiter uh, did research with UFO abductees. And what he did was he found a number of UFO abductees. The exact number was 15. And these UFO abductees all had magnetic sensitivity. He tested them and all of them could reliably tell when a magnet was moving around their head, around the back of their head. Uh, and when it wasn't there, they could tell. And all of these people claimed to have strange experiences at night, everything from UFO abductions to having visitations, strange visitations from what appeared to be alien beings. He set up uh, an experiment. He started by creating a device he called a MEM, M-E-M, and it stood for Magnetic Event Monitor. And this, this little device he put under the beds of the 15 abductees. And then every day he would come and he'd take some notes from them. What kind of experiences did you have that night? Did you sleep okay or whatever? And he would check the monitor, see if there were magnetic events during the night, which actually in his research were defined as a movement in the needle, a magnetic force strong enough to move the needle. And he used about five degrees. It was uh, it was somewhere between four and five degrees. It had to be that much in order for the magnetic event monitor to, uh, to record. What he found was this, that uh, on the nights that the UFO abductees had strange experiences, generally they were visitations, a few of them reported abductions. On those nights, he found that the magnetic monitors did in fact register that something had happened. And he also had it to where it would register the time that it happened. Now this research was published in, it started in a scientific journal, and then he published three articles in alternate AP magazine, uh, which Brent Rains and I were then editing. That's why I know a lot about this. I read and edited his articles. Um, so again, there was a, a strong correlation, a, a close to one-to-one -one correlation between these magnetic events and people having the weird visitation experiences. Um, I have a so, quick question. Uh, go ahead, what, sure. So what what are we talking here? Is this more? Do you think? Because um, now we're you know we're talking about abductions and weird. I know. I know. Uh, do you think that this is something? like some sort of side effect of magnetism and us being on this planet and you know or, or do you think that <laughs> yeah. there's some sort of teleological explanation meaning that there's purpose behind it from some other sentient entity or being or beings or something along those lines 
Well, that's the big que- that's the big question, uh, and that's the one I was going to sort of answer at the end. But I will. All right, I will we can answer, put a, put a pin I'll, I'll answer. Want. I'll oh, answer a bit right. of that now. Uh, the the thinking is is that certain people, um, because of brain structure or electromagnetic sensitivity, uh, or maybe certain uh, a certain amount of neurotransmitters in different areas of the brain. Maybe there's something about the, uh, the, light, the light antennas that we all have inside of our eyes that I've talked about many times on your show. Uh, the rods and the cones are actually antennas that pick up different frequencies in the electromagnetic energy spectrum. But there's something different about these people uh, to where maybe they can sense something that everybody else can't sense. Maybe they can see them, and maybe it takes a certain uh, electromagnetic frequency to make it work. So that's that's part of the theory too. Uh, I haven't said what I really think yet, and that I think I'll, I'll save to the end. But uh, what he found is that there was a period when this all peaked. All of the magnetic events occurred between two thirty and 3.30 in the morning, and they peaked around the time period of 3 a.m., specifically 3.15. 3.15 is when they peaked, 3.15 a.m. Now, he did not say whether this was, I don't remember him saying whether it was standard time or daylight saving time or whatever, but at at that point in time, electromagnetic fields are extremely stable because they have been out of the solar winds uh, for hours. You know, it's nighttime and it's real stable. That's what I call the night effect. The, you know, weird things happen at night and people say, oh, it's dark and it's spooky, you know, and you can get spooked and all that. But the other thing is this, the electromagnetic fields, the ambient fields are much more stable than on the side of the earth where the, where the sun is shining because the solar winds. So uh, this, this 315 thing in the morning got me thinking maybe the exact same thing happens in a solar eclipse, that there is a magnetic event that occurs at the solar eclipse. We do know through scientific that said that he didn't believe that it could possibly be that strong. So uh, I set this little survey up. I asked people to go to mound sites. Some people did not go to mound sites, but they recorded elsewhere. Are we still up? I had a weird event on my end just now. That was weird. Yeah. Seriously, like, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know. Well, there was some sort of magnetic anomaly happening over here. So. All right. Well, I, I don't know. No, I don't brainwave. know. Maybe but, somebody is listening to this and creating yeah, it's some the machine weird elves. Brainwave. They're getting us. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. All right. Sorry. I Go set, ahead. I set this up on Twitter and Facebook and ask people, and I specifically ask, take a a you know like a field compass. Not, don't use your phone. A lot of people wanted their phone. The phone doesn't measure the magnetic field the same way as a field compass does. And I wanted to know if it would actually physically move a needle because if it physically moves a needle, it can physically move the magnetite in the human brain. So initially, a lot of people said they were going to do it. A lot of people weren't able to. Uh, I recorded, I, I told people how I was going to record that I was going to use a camera and put it on the, the, the whole time, put it on the face of the compass uh, because it would be several minutes. And if you're watching the needle, then you can't look up and look at the eclipse. That's the thing. And even I, I got to the point where I, I used a really good video camera to record the needle. And then I saw the full eclipse and it was incredible. So I moved that camera up quick and used the zoom on it to get a shot of the full eclipse and put it back. Uh, and but other people, including a scientist out there, uh, recorded the whole thing. Uh, a lot of people simply watched it, uh, and altogether, I got ten usable responses. There were people uh, that a lot of people that said, "My data, I, I really can't trust it because I mainly watch the eclipse and I glance down at it now and then." Uh, so, out of the ten responses, there were five that were almost identical, virtually identical. And only in one, only one of those five was actually watching the needle. Uh, 
Uh, and that person watched it almost the entire time and was not in the 100% eclipse window. That person was in like the 99%. And I will say there's a massive difference in viewing it between 99% and 100. I've seen other eclipses that are 99%. Uh, and 100 uh, is so different. It's it's an amazing thing. And I'm glad I saw it. It's the only one. It's probably the only one I'll ever see because the next one that I could see is probably 20 years away. So those five, there were 10 people all together. Five had identical results. And those results, including what I saw, uh, there was a movement of the needle at the exact moment of the full eclipse. And all of these, these were in Missouri and in Arkansas uh, and two in Indiana and one in, I believe it's Ohio. Uh, the person, I didn't write down the exact location on my little data sheet here. There were five in Ohio, including Serpent Mound and on um, Monk's Mound. And while while I know people were really excited about that, the problem with those sites is they have thousands of people during an eclipse. Uh, and that's what they said. At the moment of the eclipse, you know, people jumped up and down and, oh, yay, and all that. And uh, that actually uh, can cause some electromagnetic disturbances. But out of 10, five said they saw nothing. All five of those that saw nothing, none of them recorded it. Uh, they all just simply watched it. Uh, and virtually all of them said, I had to look up. I had to look up now and then. Uh, so the five that saw it all saw it's a subtle movement. It began again right at the moment of the full eclipse. It, it was between a half a degree and one degree. That's what it was. Uh, and it's very subtle. It's, you really had to watch closely or you had to film the thing happening up close because a half a degree is one 720th of that circle. That's a half a degree and it's really hard uh, to see. Uh, out of the five that saw it at the beginning, four people also, uh, sorry, uh, two people, just two people saw it at the end. The person who I've said is a scientist saw it at the beginning and the end. He used a really good camera. Uh, and when I saw it, I didn't notice the direction. I was so shocked because I didn't think there'd be any result at all. I didn't think it would work. Uh, I didn't see the direction that it went. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out which way it went. It was so subtle. But he saw it move one direction. And then when the eclipse ended, it moved the other direction. So those are the results. Five saw it. Five did not. 50-50. Um, some of the people that didn't see it, the five that didn't see it, they weren't all in the full eclipse zone. Uh, some of them were in the, the 90, 95%, 90 to 98% area. So that's the theory uh, and that's the results. Um, if anybody wanted to ask a question. Um, we do have, have a I, couple questions. Right. Uh, we'll shout out real quick to True Seekers. Thank you so much. Appreciate the super chat. Um, Scarlet H um, is asking, Greg, could the 3 a.m. time be the reason a lot of people wake up at that time regardless um, of the time that they sleep? My answer to that would be I, I, would, I would certainly agree with that. Um, I don't have any proof of it. There's no proof, except I know that there's, it's kind of a click. I used to call it the, the 3 a.m. click. Uh, in fact, I woke up last night at 3.15, and I woke up the night before at 3.15. I don't know why, because normally I, I sleep. I woke up last night at the same, not 3.15, but like 3.30-ish. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a night owl as it is, so it's not that yeah. much longer after I go to bed, but... The three, you know, you could say, oh, somebody's got to go to the bathroom or your bladder's only so large or whatever. The, the interesting thing I will say, and I don't know if you can speak to this too, but, um, and part of it's physiology in biology, but um, if you, you know, depending if somebody uses alcohol or cannabis, this can vary. I tend to use cannabis sometimes, so I don't dream as much as a normal person. Um, but when I wake up at three o'clock and I go back to bed, uh, not only 
do I dream more often, but I can also induce lucid dreams way more e easily oh, yeah. that way. Yeah. Well, I, I cannot, I have not, I don't dream much anyway. I, I literally block my dreams. Uh, years ago, I used to do a lot of dream analysis and I do them on myself. I did it with people too. Uh, I used to do demonstrations in college classes where I'd have students make up dreams on the spot very quickly, make them up and then tell, reveal things about themselves based on what they make up very quickly, which it's basically a, a, a psychology projection technique when you ask somebody to make up a dream. Uh, but sometimes you reveal some rather uh, embarrassing things about yourself when you do that. Uh, but I, I do think that there is something to it. I do believe that the brain is being affected by magnetic fields. Uh, certainly, we know that some people are very sensitive to magnetic fields and some are not. And I've actually written that I believe that, that skeptics, there are ultra skeptics that believe everything is nonsense. And by everything, I mean people that that see UFOs, people that have abduction experiences, see people that see entities or little beings, uh, they just think it's all nonsense. Or they say, oh, it's a hallucination, meaning it's all in your head and it's all biochemical. Well, that's, see that, that, that's that. always the problem I run into with this is like the people that you're talking about, it's not even worth engaging with them because they've already made up their mind the other way. So like we can obviously have dogma within these fringe communities where people are dogmatic. There are liars there are charlatans there are grifters well, sure. there, are, there are that does exist i mean let's not pretend it doesn't but at the same time there are your skeptics kind of doing the same thing where they're writing books and blogs and reviewing things some of these people wouldn't have jobs either if it wasn't for the fringe people that for they're, that they're <laughs> yeah. talking about yeah. um so so that's a thing too so for me it's like um this is something i always ask and this you know when we made the documentary and you contributed your part and everything um, it's something I asked myself. I said, is it possible that anybody that's ever had a UFO sighting or an alien, you know, encounter, is it possible that it's some sort of mind virus or whatever? And it's just, to me, that would be as absurd as some, you know, external force or entity or whatever, um, being the cause of that. Meaning that I don't know the answer and I'm not pretending that I yeah. do, but I will say there's got to be something to this of thousands and millions yeah. of people. So it's like either the mind is so suggestible and we're just biological androids, which I guess, again, I always leave that door open. Um, or there is some sort of rhyme or reason or purpose or, you know, plan or whatever, you know. So let me get weird with this. So, and I've, I've written this in several books. I believe there's a difference be, between skeptics and those who have experiences. First of all, in talking to a lot of skeptics, I know they really haven't had any experiences. If you, if you went outside and you saw an alien being and you had the experience, somebody's not going to con convince you that you didn't. But here's here's the thing. I think that skeptics don't have sufficient magnetite in their brain to be sensitive to it. And I think people that are overwhelmed with these experiences have too much magnetite in their brain. And I, and I think that the chosen ones, like the old biblical idea of the chosen ones, I think their, their brains has, were made out of pure magnetite. Well, no. <laughs> I think I think that there is something and magnetite would be somewhat the amount of magnetite in the brain would have something to do with where you were born and what your parents regularly consumed, uh, what's in the ambient atmosphere and so on. Uh, but it's probably also somewhat genetic in that uh, it would a fix in certain spots in the brain. Initially, it was found in the hippocampus. Uh, that's where it was found in 1992. And I was really shocked when I read that. And I wrote about that in 1994. Uh, but that's my real belief in this. I think that it does relate. It may not just simply be magnetite. The magnetite probably interacts with certain neurotransmitters in different areas of the brain. And the truth is a lot of differences in us in personality and in, in intelligence 
and verbal ability and mathematical skill and all of that, that's all determined by genetics. And it has to do with the way the brain forms. It has to do with um, whether different areas of the brain are larger or smaller. There are differences, for example, in criminal populations. This is research from the 90s. Uh, we talked slightly about well, that's this. your background, right, is criminal yes, psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the most violent criminals have literally physically smaller prefrontal cortex, which is right up here, right behind the right behind the forehead. And the prefrontal cortex is where it's always been speculated. That's where the conscience is. But it's the area where we make decisions and it can, and those decisions can override impulses. For example, I'm sure at some time in your life, you've been so ticked off at work at a boss that you wanted to say something to him. But a part of you said, nah, I don't want to do that. I'd lose and There's no use getting him angry. I might lose my job. Well, that's what the prefrontal cortex is doing. It is tamping down the emotions. It's, th it's, it's thinking through the emotions. So would somebody that has that like explosive disorder or whatever yes. that thing is, they have the same thing where that part of the... That's who they studied to come up okay. with this. They literally took these people uh, and they did MRIs on them and CAT scans on them uh, to measure the physical size of the prefrontal lobe as well uh, in comparison to other brain areas. Because I know that, that well, I forget what it's called, but like back in the day when they didn't really know anything about brain chemistry and physiology, they had this, you know, like this part of the brain does this. And the, I forget yeah. what it's called, but um, obviously that's wrong. But what what I find interesting is there's proof. So like, I forget the whole story, but Einstein's brain was actually... It's in a uh, bottle. It, well, yeah, but but it's been cut up and like, I yeah. forgot, like preserved in some way. Um, and some people have some pieces and other people, some, the guy that initially took it and was like on the run with it or something. I forget this. There's a weird story behind it. Yeah. Anyways, um, while they say like the size of your brain does not matter in terms of right. intelligence, the thing that, that Einstein had that made him so different or so much more... I guess, transcendent or intelligent uh, is the one part of your um, brain where you can uh, visualize like yeah, mathematical visual stuff. W your visual cortex was a lot larger um, than the uh, like a normal person. So like he yeah. was able to visualize things that people uh, like most people can't. So um, again, I think that I agree with what you're saying. Like there's obviously we all have different strengths and different things based on our own physiology and chemistry and everything like that and we have disadvantages too um, yeah, absolutely so i think i think that again skeptics have just different brains and they see the world differently they never have strange experiences uh the reason that i'm really in this uh it's it it's it started with my own experiences that i've never talked about and probably won't uh, and I was curious about them, you know, where's this coming from and what that, what in, in thinking about my own experiences, it got me interested in other people's experiences. And I know we've been on and we've talked about the psychic, so-called psychic Edgar Casey. Uh, and Edgar Casey, I don't believe was a psychic. That's another story. Uh, I've got an article about that, that the AR, that is going into the ARE, which is the Casey organization, but I don't believe Casey was what people think of as a psychic, but, uh, I got interested in Casey. I got interested in UFO abductees. I got interested in people that reported ghost sightings, uh, all of that and talked to the people Did a lot of interviews. I've never done MRIs or CAT scans on them. Uh, but I've read a lot of research about all that and published a lot in that field. So I do believe that there are physical differences in the brain uh, and maybe certain connections. You know, the, the big difference, Einstein did have a much larger cortex. The cortex is the outer covering of the brain. Our brain, you know, has lots of folds in it. Uh, it's folded all over, and that's to make the cortex bigger and bigger. Uh, and then there are connections that run through it. And yes, there are certain areas that operate certain bodily functions. Uh, like, you know, when you go to sleep, you don't have to, con you know, you don't have to consciously keep breathing. That's one thing. When you start thinking about that, when I did this in college, when I made people think about it in college, uh, teaching classes, it kind of freaked them out because I'd say, 
you know, you're breathing, you're inhaling and exhaling. You don't have to think about that. How is that happening? When I you actually, go to this is what, what, what I've been doing, I guess. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know you know, if I have a big brain, I know I have a big head. I have a size eight fitted hat, which is pretty big. Um, and it barely fits, but, um, but yeah, that I find all that there's actually good, uh, great courses on that Einstein thing oh, I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, let me pull it up here and so I can recommend it to people. Great courses is on audible where they go through different topics. There's the, the ancient Egypt one's great. Uh, Bob Breyer's got a, you know, talk on there, which is great. Okay, so this one's called Philosophy of Mind, Brains, Consciousness, and Thinking Machines by Patrick Grimm. Um, it's the great courses. And he goes through, like, the evolution of thought and, you know, starts with the beginning of philosophy and stuff and then goes up, um, uh, you know, goes up through there and then gets to, like, science. And then he gets up to... You know, they were creating the first computers in Great Britain in like the 1800s, but they didn't have enough money for some of these people that were working on the stuff. It just kept, you know, bleeding them out and stuff. But very interesting. Check that out. Um, but so back to the um, the mound stuff and, and the magnetite and yeah. everything. My only question with the skeptic thing is, couldn't it just be, though... And I'm, I'm going to be honest. So, like, when we started the show, I was biased. I was like, oh, scientists and their dogma and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, re repeating all the rhetoric you hear, the big shots, the Graham Hancocks. And, the, you know, but I didn't really know what I was saying in particular. So I just went full in on philosophy from the dialogues, read them a bunch of times, to analyzing the dialogues, to just what we know through the great philosophers um, that's been recorded. And through that process, I realized my own cognitive biases, biases of other people. Now when I look at anything and I'm looking, trying to understand the origin, I'm trying to understand it through what I either know about that person that was studying it or what I can know as a human being. And I just feel like with the skeptic thing, I'm not anti-skeptic anymore, but I just realized them as having a different type of dogma as the people that are like full on woo believers. Doesn't matter what they're told. They watched one YouTube oh, yeah. video and whatever, but there's people doing real research. Like, you know, in these there fringe, are. in the fringe community, I would say, you know, there are very honest people like you and, you know, I can name a bunch that we've had on the show, but you can just go back and watch our episodes. I think I'm a pretty good curator of who is actually doing honorable research and who's not and um the skeptic thing to me is one in which you know even like for instance michael Shermer had what you're talking about an experience with like a radio on his wedding day and his wife he was trying to fix this radio for months or something like that and all of a sudden um on the day of his wedding the radio s starts playing and it's like his wife's dad's song to her and everybody got emotional it's just like well that sounds crazy that you wouldn't have looked at that and been like there's some sort of rhyme or reason to that you know whether whatever it is it doesn't have to be yeah. one specific i think the problem is what i'm trying to break down is, is is through learning philosophy through learning how the mind works is language we yeah. none of us can agree on what we're talking about because none of us really agree on terms whether it's god consciousness uh, you name it, all these words are words that are interpreted in different ways by different people. So I think for me, I've just come to understand it as like a language barrier or breakdown. And, um, I don't know, I've had like Mick West on and he seemed, you know, like we don't agree on stuff, but he didn't seem like he was the worst person in the world, you know? So it's like these, these people, whatever they think, again, it just comes down to do you have a horse in the race? If you're running a channel debunking people, you have a horse in the race. I'm sorry, but you do. Whether you think you're doing something honorable or not, you still are in the game. So Yeah. Well that's I I would agree with you um wholeheartedly in all of that. But I do I really do think that there's a difference between the ultra skeptics and I don't even want to call them believers. experiencers is a much better term. People that have experiences. Uh, and again, if you have if you have an experience, then, you know, you may not know what it is, but, you know, there's something out there, something. So I, I think that shaman, you know, shaman in 
in the mound building culture, shaman were hereditary. You could become a medicine person, a medicine man or a medicine woman uh, by, you know, being a, a helper um, and, and learning how to do it. But shaman were usually her hereditary. Uh, and I think there's a hereditary link there. Shaman definitely have experiences. Uh, and I think that they're born that way. A lot of people ask me all the time, and I think we've talked about this on your show too. Why do they choose certain sites and why do they build these sites certain ways? Why do they make the geometric earthworks into certain shapes? Well, basically it was a shaman uh, that tells them to do that. And the shaman are in touch with something other people aren't. Shaman can walk through areas and they feel different forces. Uh, and to the skeptic that doesn't feel it, you know, they say, oh, that's nonsense. I could use other words, but I'm not going to. But they just say that's complete nonsense. It's like dowsing. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of skeptics will say dowsing is complete nonsense. Um, I've doused one time. It means nothing. I've, I never had the inclination to do it, but I had a grandfather that did it. Uh, and he was very well respected in our town. He was an elected official in the little town in Pennsylvania. Uh, and his father did dowsing. I didn't know that till some years later. Uh, but I went on to a ranch, uh, the uh, Bradshaw Ranch in Arizona, uh, and did dowsing when there was a guy who does work in physics there who was monitoring the Bradshaw Ranch, which is like a the earlier version of Skinwalker Ranch was Bradshaw Ranch. Uh, Can you and, describe dowsing really quick? Because I'm sure there's going to be people that uh, don't well, know what that is. Dowsing is, uh, you use, you generally today use two metal rods that eat, that you can, you, you hold it in your hand and it would come, get a pencil here. Ah, I can use this, but you'd hold the, the rod in your hand and then it has an extension. But because the rod is kept into in a round tube, it can easily swing. So you put one in each hand. Some people use wooden sticks that are always made out of certain sticks. And I've heard of different types of wood they use, so I'm not even going to name it because somebody say, oh, no, no, we use this one. But you walk through an area holding them uh, level in front of you. And as you walk through an area, the the rods will turn around certain directions based upon what is under you and it might be a flow of water uh, that's been the main use of dowsing uh, i know that some people did it for oil uh, and i know of many cases with oil dowsing where it didn't work uh, edgar casey's uh, edgar casey did oil dowsing with the group uh, and it didn't work Water dowsing and electrical field dowsing is another thing. Uh, but there are many people that absolutely swear by it and they will drill uh, in these areas. Uh, and usually they find something. Uh, so, but skeptics will say, you know, it's hit or miss, it's just dumb luck or whatever, that if you do it enough, sooner or later you're going to have a hit. Uh, so that's how dowsing works. But I think dowsing does pick up what is called subtle energy. And subtle energy is electromagnetic energy. The earth generates its own field. And it's called the Schumann resonance. Uh, and I've talked ab about how to, how to kind of meld yourself into a mound site, how to really feel the site and experience it. And it's not by going in and using drugs or anything. The first time you go to a mound site, if you really want to That's experience That's not what I heard. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, you, the, the best way to do this is to go there, try to have nobody else there when you're there, or find a really quiet place. Find a place to sit. You don't have to sit on a mound. The whole area was used. But find a place where you can sit down, have some bare part of your, uh, of your body, even a finger, touch the earth, not necessarily the grass or a plant, but touch the earth close your eyes and focus your attention on the sound. Just focus on the sound and try to geolocate sounds. Hopefully there'll be birds, there'll be some wind noise through the grass or the trees or whatever's there. Just focus on the sound and that will connect you to whatever energies there might be at the site. 
Now, of course, skeptics will say that's nonsense. That's fine. I don't care what they say. Uh, lots of people do this and find that they connect with something. They feel some sort of spiritual connection to it. And sometimes they feel a not so spiritual connection. They feel bad things that might have happened there. Uh, and I, uh, they well, Sorry, I was, I was just going to say to to your point, though, it's like that is real. I um, we go on this camping trip to northern Michigan every year. I've been going since I was like five or six years old. Um, and it's on the banks of the Manistee uh, River. And when we get up there, I mean, it's it's a state campground, so it's not. You know, there's some hikers and stuff like that, but there's not like a ton of people around or anything like that. But when you get up there and it's you've left the city and whatever, the stillness, like you're talking about the wind, the water trickling, it's like meditative. And in fact, Maurice has even made a meditation video on this one site from around there. So it's a cool it's a cool thing and I, I do agree with what you're saying. I think there is some sort of frequency or resonance when you get look, if everything's matter that's vibrating at a certain frequency, I don't know how what you're saying could be wrong. So Well the the Schumann resonance is the same when I talk about molding melding with it, the brain generates an electromagnetic field. An electroencephalograph measures your electromagnetic field. An electroencephalograph, you know, they'll put it around your head, different areas of your head, and they're measuring your electromagnetic activity. All right. So you've probably heard of beta, theta, alpha, all that. Okay. So you reach the Schumann, your brain reaches the Schumann resonance or that, that magnetic field frequency when you are right between uh, awake and asleep. That's when you reach it. And at that point, when you're, and that's a meditative state, you're not asleep, you're aware, but you're not totally awake. When you're right at that cusp between being awake and asleep, that is when you are in absolute harmony with the ambient frequency of the earth. And if you believe in like the plasma theory that, that Andrew and I put out in the book Origins of the Gods, the same theory that we both had since the 80s, actually, that we are mold, that there are, there are electromagnetic plasmas that, that are def definitely related to UFOs and abduction experiences and entity experiences and so on and visitations. When, you, when you're at that state, you are at that frequency. And that is the frequency where people have the experiences. And actually, I believe that that's where people are, like that 3 a.m. thing. Uh, and it, like when you wake up, it's your before you wake up, you go through that frequency. And because we're on the the dark side of the earth at 3 a.m., the you are being bathed in the uh, Schumann resonance. Uh, and I think it's 4.7 or 7.4. I can't, I have too many numbers floating in my head. Somebody asked me recently on a podcast about a bunch of mounds, just threw them out and wanted me to say, you know, all kinds of numbers from them. And I said, look, I, there's 8,000 mounds in that book. I cannot uh, remember all of that. I remember the big ones. And even now when I post them, I got to look up stuff. I simply can't remember it all. And I'm getting old too. So I do, I do believe that there's something to this. I believe in the Native American uh, idea that all things are connected. I believe that all things are spiritual in the way they believe. 7.83 hertz. There you go. I was close. I was going to say 4.7. Then, then I said 7.4 because I knew it was somewhere around there. Uh, but that's the ambient earth frequency. And it is a, it's an electromagnetic frequency that the earth puts out. And I've also told you on other podcasts that with all this electromagnetic stuff around us from cell phones to electric wires everywhere to the Wi-Fi that's over here next to me, uh, all the cell towers that are everywhere and G, G4, G5 and uh, cell towers. I mean, towers. imagine if, if Tesla got his way, we'd be like all electrified by now well, with the I'm, amount of electricity I'm in the air. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so... I do believe that we're having more unbalancing experiences uh, rather than the kinds where 
I've described in some of the books where Native Americans would have these experiences at critical times when a being would appear to them. Usually the being comes down from the sky and is bathed in light. They're almost always in a bubble of light. And then the being would come out at a critical time and talk to an, an, an individual. And the reason that those are in their legends is because they were important experiences that they had. Uh, and in the 50s, before we had all this, before we had all this electromagnetic energy, people saw, you know, that was the day of the Space Brothers. And people would say that, you know, a UFO landed and uh, an alien looking sort of like us would walk out and tell us that we are in the process of destroying ourselves, that we're not just polluting the earth, but we are on the path of destroying ourselves with nuclear energy. And that has changed. You don't hear that anymore. You don't hear those kind of experiences. Things, things have changed as we have put out more and more electromagnetic pollution. And that's not, that's not a term I made up. That's actually in the medical literature. They're worried about electromagnetic pollution now, that it is causing anxiety and depression. You know, and there's a fantastic increase in mental disorders right now. And they believe that it has something to do with the electromagnetic pollution. And there's no doubt electromagnetic fields affect the brain. I mean, How they all, do it, I think it's magnetite. All that plus, think about all the actual space garbage uh, oh. in orbit. Like, it's almost like a gauntlet. Like, if anything tries to enter or exit, I mean, kudos to our space programs that get stuff out. But it's just with yeah. when you see those, like graphs and models where they show you how much stuff's up there it's like how is anything getting out or in like that's insane yeah. it is it is amazing it is amazing so let me summarize the results again uh, in case some people just came in the magnetic survey had 10 really good responses uh five of them found no effect in those five people uh, only one of them actually filmed the thing. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. One of them did film it, saw nothing. And he actually was in a, the, he was the guy that was in the 98 degree. It was 98 degree coverage, not 100%. So five saw no response at all. Four of those five just looked at it, the, the compass a little bit and looked up uh, at the sun, which I did too, uh, but I filmed it. Uh, there were five that had the exact same result in the beginning. That is, uh, five people saw a blip. That is, that the compass needle moved a half a degree to one degree at the very beginning of the eclipse. Uh, and then out of the five, uh, two saw it move back at the end of the eclipse. Uh, out of the five that saw the needle move, Four of those five actually filmed the whole thing. One of the people did not film it, but observed it. And he looked up at the, he said he couldn't help himself. He looked up at the eclipse when it was full. Uh, so he didn't watch it the whole time. But that's the summary of the results. I really thank people for doing this. Uh, there were another 10 or 20 people that said, well, my data is not really good enough. Uh, but the other thing I did, let me see if I can find it here. I thought I had one real close. Let me get up for one second. I'll be right back. Okay. While he's getting up, I'll play. So I was viewing this in the Detroit area. We were at like 99.2%. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah on you're good. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it. But I made uh, these T-shirts for the participants. Look at that. Total solar eclipse. Look at that. That's a cool yeah. t-shirt. Yeah, it is. And I actually autographed them. Uh, and I'd like to send you one. Oh, uh, I, have, right. I have a XL here. I've only got an XL. And You're then good. X I got How about this? I am definitely not an XL. I'm trying to get there. Um, but <laughs> well, someday. <laughs> but I want you to give that to somebody else because I, I, I I've already given them away to I've already shipped these. Well, if you to, want to ship one to me, actually, you know who I'll give it. I'll give it to Maurice because he will okay. wear it. I'll give That'd it to Maurice. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, but there you go. Uh, I'm even going to autograph it. I've auto I've never autographed cloth stuff before, uh, but I'll do an nice. autograph at the bottom. Uh, that's that's awesome. actually kind of hard to do. I don't know how the NBA 
Yeah, I don't know. They must have special pens or something. Well, there is. Uh, It took me a while to find it, but there are special pens. Oh, okay. Uh, But still, the it's difficult. It's difficult. Sure. Um, But that that's my story. That that's so. You want me to pull up your uh, video real quick? Let's show some of these. Sure. You can show people how I did it, and then when I quickly move the camera up to look at the full eclipse. Okay. Here, let me pull it up here. And again, I'll say a full eclipse is nothing like 99%. Uh, on, you don't need is... the glasses in a full eclipse. Why is this so mini? I got to blow this thing up here. Hold on. Of course. <laughs> now it's tilted at an angle. It's, hold it's, on, well, hold, on, hold on. Hurt. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Oh, it's still on an that's, angle. Hold on. That, that's all right. That's the That's how I filmed the thing. I hit a camera right over it looking at it. Uh, and, and, uh, there you go. And if actually, if you have the sound, you'll be able to hear some of the sounds around me. And I had a light on my camera oh my God. because it got, it gets dark during the eclipse and I knew you wouldn't be able to see it. Okay. That's the full eclipse. There we go. Yep. And that's just using a really good video camera from around the year 2003. Here, I'll play it one more time here. I don't know why it was green at the bottom. Um, so, this is, no, this was a cool idea. I wish more you people see did. A bug like, moving around on it. <laughs> yeah, I wish more people did like experiments and stuff. If they were going to be, you know, everybody's setting up these festivals and rock concerts and jam band concerts and all sorts of cool stuff. But I like this kind of stuff. That was a hand. That's just handheld. Believe it or not, I just okay. moved it up real quick and shot that. Here, um, let me see if I can pull up. Uh, I think I took a couple. Here's a couple cool shots I took. This was through the gl- the glasses in my camera. Oh yeah, yeah. During the my full, wife did that this also. is at co- the yeah. complete, you know, oh, eclipsing. Wow. Let me see this. This was from, uh, yeah. You see the halo, almost mm-hmm. like a sun dog effect a little bit, right? Yeah. There's a shot. Um. Let me see here. Yeah, see that little to the right there? Yes. The, yeah. That's that's what the eclipse looked like here in the total eclipse when it was at because we were at in outside of Detroit ninety nine point two percent. Right. So if, imagine that turned, you know, kind of counterclockwise oh, yeah. a bit. That's kind of what it, it looked like. Well, I was at Tawasagi Mounds in southeastern Missouri. It's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's near East Prairie, which is a tiny, tiny little town. Yeah. Uh, we'd been there before. That's a cool picture. That's yeah. a really cool that picture. That one, I think I changed the saturation a little bit, but I didn't do anything yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we thought there'd be nobody there at all. Uh, actually, the people with me, my wife and two other people went along. We thought there'd be nobody because it's so remote. Uh, and as it turned out, there were about 25 people there. And... Uh, the state of uh, Missouri, it's a state park. It's a tiny little state park. Uh, and the Missouri um, D- Division of State Parks uh, had employees at every state park to handle the crowds. And they had shut down a number of the parks because they said there were too many people, nowhere to park. You couldn't drive anywhere because the, the, the traffic was at a complete standstill. But they actually had T-shirts there at the park. Uh, se- they were selling. Uh, they weren't like this, but they had T-shirts there. But still, it was very quiet, uh, and I, it it is dramatic. The full eclipse is dramatic, and I can see why you would do a ritual before it. Uh, during it, I could visualize pretty much what I have come up with with how they did these rituals. They actually worked themselves into a frenzy uh, before the full eclipse through whistles and drumming and certain kinds of dancing. But during the full eclipse itself, they were totally quiet, totally silent. And then when it ended, that was it Uh, because it gets light immediately. I mean, it's astonishing how there's light and then suddenly it's dark when it goes full. The temperature temperature dropped dramatically. It was like 77 degrees when we were on the mound, but it cooled down probably to the 60s almost instantly, and a wind kicked up. It was very strange, actually. Exact same thing happened here, but it went from like 50 or 55 to like 40, 45. Yeah. Um, 
And I was just thinking in that moment too, like I was outside cause my wife and I were taking turns during the few minutes of the total, um, you know, one would watch our son and then we'd switch back and forth. When I was out there, I was thinking to myself, like, it is getting so cold. Imagine if, you know, the times of when, um, like, super volcanoes or there was some sort of asteroid or comet impact and all the debris blocking out the sun, everything would get so cold, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we know that. That's recorded in history too you know lake toba and all these different you know they can look and see the the temperature variations and i think there was one big one not that long ago in new zealand that we were able to record through ancient texts and stuff a temperature difference and stuff like that yeah. so um that that's kind of crazy to think about that something like that could have that much and you think oh, okay 10 degrees 20 degrees not that much but Imagine now growing crops and change changes yeah. of cycles of seasons and you know that can have a massive impact. It's dramatic. It it it's a dramatic effect. Well, Maurice, uh, Maurice, Mike, good guy. You said Maurice. I'll take it as a compliment. I did this to you, did uh, this to you before in another show, uh, and I was. Pretty it's just exhausted a cool. It's just a night. cooler name, bro. I I don't take offense. I don't know. To, yeah. um, I appreciate it. Uh, when we're done here, hang on a minute so we can, uh, I can get an address from you and I'll send this thing to you. Yeah. So my, my question um, is, uh, okay. Scarlett wants to know, is there a way to buy one of these? Uh, uh, you know, I bought these on Amazon, uh, and I didn't ask a guy to do it. There's a guy who kind of follows my work and well, he doesn't kind of, he follows my work and he's made a bunch of t-shirts, uh, based on, um, uh, stuff I talk about, about mounds. Uh, one of them says, has the Mound Builder Society logo with some other things on it. Another one is the, um, the, the Native American term for all things are connected, uh, which is a, a phrase that is used a lot in Native American literature. Um, they are available on Amazon. Uh, there is a link on my Twitter page it's probably way down, but I'll repost it tonight. Uh, when we get off this, I'll repost the thing. Uh, I'm not trying to s sell the T-shirts, but actually I appreciate it. it. It's very well done. And before he posted it, he said, hey, is this, is this okay with you if I do this? And I said, sure. So I wound up buying, uh, buy, paying him full price to, to buy the ones that I mailed off to people. Uh, and I didn't mind doing it. I, if if 50 people had done this, I would have mailed out 50 of them because I appreciate it. And I thought if I run out of them, I'm going to send them all a book because uh, I appreciate them doing it. It was a way for me to look at a theory. Uh, the only way I could look at a theory that I had back in 1992 to 1994, that's when it uh, popped into my head. And that's a long time ago. Uh, but I couldn't test it any other way. So I'm glad I'm, I do plan on doing the 3 a.m. testing thing. Uh, I want to see if the, if the magnetic blip is everywhere. Um, because, and it, 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 again, he tested it only with people that had, uh, these experiences, people that were first magnetically sensitive and secondly, people that had reported abductions and they were all multiple abductees. They weren't just one time abductees. They were multiple. So my, uh, my belief is, well, this 3 a.m. Click probably happens everywhere. Uh, you don't have to everywhere. convince me, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> three, three a.m.s. I mean, not recently within the last few years since we've had my son, but when I was younger, late twenties, early thirties, I was a night owl. So I'd be up doing research, looking into all this weird stuff, uh, you know, cannabis, psychedelics, whatever. Um, and those were some of my weirdest experiences were t two to f like 3 a.m. Like the, what do they call it? The witching hour or something yeah. like that, you know? Yeah. So yeah, there's something to it. In fact, <laughs> my wife and I still talk about this at like, when we were still living outside of Chicago in the suburbs, there was one night, I think it was like 2.30 ish, maybe it was three o'clock we heard this owl and I look out the window and it's literally the moonlight like a, a shaft of light coming from the moon illuminating this owl sitting on the ground 
and it's just doing this whoo whoo and it kept us up for like an hour just doing this and i just yeah. remember like this is weird like what is this i mean you know maybe it's taken in the moon or whatever but go up in a tree you know let us get some sleep yeah. here i don't need any ufos showing up or anything you know well the what you know you know how skeptics say all this you know it's the deepest time of sleep supposedly uh and of course that's when all kinds of things happen uh, when it's dark you know you can get spooked and so on and you can see movements and shadows and whatever uh, and then it's all mind games that's what they say but i think there's something other than mind games at work here uh, i do believe that there's something going on uh, i think that electromagnetic fields are related to it but there's something else to it it's not just that you know you're hallucinating it's not just that there's something else going on uh and uh, maybe that can be the the topic of something later uh, because that would take us a long time to dig into too but it, it actually all my ideas came from the native american lore it's all from their belief system um and actually, I didn't come up with any of this on my own. None of it. None of this is my theories or beliefs or anything else. It's just pieced together from what I have learned from uh, Native American lore and the mound building populations. Incredible culture. Absolutely incredible. Very spiritual. Uh, and I believe they chose to live with nature. In fact, that's what they said they did, that it was all about harmonizing with nature. And I think that's why they rejected using the wheel. Uh, even after wheels were over here, they still would pack everything up when they had a horse. They packed everything up behind them and they would drag it. Uh, but at some point, all that sort of disappeared and, you know, they got guns and they started using metal and so on. But that was after 90 percent of the mound building culture was killed off by the diseases that the Spanish brought in. If you're interested in that too, you can, I'll try and I'll post after we're done in the show notes, I'll post all the episodes that we've done with you in the past, including the most recent one that we did with me, you and PD Newman, where we talked about oh, yeah. native American mounds and rituals and entheogens and psychedelics. Yeah. Um, go check that out. But yeah, there was one we did where you went through kind of all the mound sites and the history. That was a really good, like a slideshow episode. So I'll put that yeah. up as well. Excellent. Well, I'm done. I appreciate it very much. Like I say, hang on for a minute and we'll take care of some other business. Okay. Uh, but I've uh, been, thank you to everybody that participated in this. I know that a lot of people that participated will watch this, not live, but later. But I do thank you. And uh, if you get one of those t-shirts, if you're one of those people that got a t-shirt, how about posting it? Let people know that I really did send it out. Uh, and I bagged them up myself and I took them to the post office, you know, and signed them and did all that. So I want people to know that, that I really did it. There were some, a couple people that did this that didn't want them because they didn't want to give an address uh, and a name. And I understand people wanting to be anonymous, you know, on and, uh, and in this day and age, you know, you, it is difficult to trust people, but Those I definitely people were Michael Shermer, or Mick West, they're secretly fans. They didn't want to give you yeah. the real information. I'm joking. Uh, whatever. It's all. It's, it's literally all the skeptics. They're like, I love this, but I don't want to admit it. <laughs> well, I have told you before. There are some archaeologists that that I am that I am uh, friends with uh, that are unnamed that have said many many times. They're not the archaeologists that follow me on Twitter. I got to I got to protect those guys. There are a couple of archaeologists that are on my Twitter feed that are great. Uh, they don't believe in any of the, you know, the, the woo stuff, I'll call it that. Uh, but I can ask them questions about pottery and about symbolism and so on. And w what is this, you know, w what are the dates of this or that? And they answer, they're very, very good. They're great. Uh, but there are some that I have been friends with through the years, mainstream archaeologists that believe in Atlantis. They believe in, in a lot of weird stuff. They believe in Edgar Casey that there was something to that man, uh, that he wasn't a hoaxer per se. They believe he was a shaman like I do. Uh, but they are unnamed and have, I've sworn that I'll never mention their names anywhere, but they're. Well, the really other thing is, you're not dog, you're not dogmatic. So, like, I think when you see those people, like, main, like, whatever you want to call them, archaeologists or 
scientists or whatever i think when they attack people it's because it's not because the work's threatened it's the rhetoric of whatever the person's yeah. using so if they're being attacked first i mean the oh, natural yeah. reaction is to attack back right i mean yeah, or hey i have real knowledge or hey you know and some of them i don't blame it's like you spend 10 years digging in the dirt in a specific area and you're going to tell some dude sitting in his mom's basement watching youtube videos <laughs> that he, that that person yeah. knows more about this yeah, ancient site like no no you don't, you don't I know. you know so um i think it's it's just we all just have to be open-minded and honest with each other and i think if we start there just being honest with ourselves too you know if you have a weird experience you have a weird experience you don't need to you know add things to it or talk it up more or embellish yeah. or hyperbolize or whatever. That's where I come from. It's like, yeah, share your experience. Like you mentioned experience or share your experience and you know, it may be anecdotal. Maybe there's multiple people, whatever, but at the end of the day, just be open-minded and we all come from different places and have different experiences. And again, the language thing is huge. What language are you using to refer to certain terms? And, um, you know, whenever you see a debate, that's why the people will agree on certain terminology before the debate. So when they get into it, people aren't being confused on their, position you know it's the yeah. same kind of a thing so yeah excellent. um it's the wild west out there what can you say but listen man yeah you're the next time you see dr gregory on the show he'll have some groundbreaking things to share but we'll leave it at i'll that. have yeah uh, we mentioned some of that we'll have something to share <laughs> i appreciate it take care I mean, good yeah. night or goodbye or good day to <laughs> yeah, everybody so watch. we're gonna end this the way we always end that all right which is we love everybody Stay safe out there. We'll catch you next time.